Okay, well, I think we'll start anyway. I mean, my my uh, my, my camera's gone off, was he? So um, anyway, I'm not going to worry too much about that. Um, welcome to CS two thirty. This is Web Information Processing. This is week one, and this is lecture one. So thanks for coming along. I see we have about 130 people here. Um, a lot more than that registered for the module, but you can catch the stream afterwards. Um, I'm going to record this for you. And it'll be available online for, re for, for replay. OK, so um, the best thing to do is just to start working through some of the slides. There's chat under, uh, available as part of this, so you can um, you can ask me questions there as we move along and I'll when I finish the lecture, I'll hang on for a few minutes afterwards and I can I can always take questions via chat. And if you want, you can always save them and let me have them um, a little bit later from Teams or email or whatever. You can make notes as you work away. So let's work through this. This is really an overview for the first part of this. I mean, I want to just well, I introduce myself and show me some of that stuff. Um, um, and give you an overview of the course and how it will work for you and for me, of course. OK, so it's a it, this is a, an introductory lecture in uh, an introductory module in web information. Problem. OK, so it's it's. Uh, it gives this overview of modern and legacy. Um, approaches to information processing in networked environments that use the HTTP protocol hypertext transport protocol, in other words, the web or the internet. So for this particular module, there are going to be um, 24 hours of formal instruction. Five of these will be the face-to-face -face, or would have been face-to-face -face, and, and may indeed be face-to-face -face if we return back to um, a situation where students can return to campus. But those will be available online, um, live via YouTube, as I've seen. Um, the lectures are going to be today on Tuesdays and um, not Thursdays. Um, but the rest of it are going to be presented online via Moodle. Okay, It's a blended learning approach. And uh, we've been doing this for a couple of years. The university like it. But given the current COVID situation, we are going to be um, working in this way. So the module is going to be taken by people with different levels of the previous experience. Okay, Some of you can be already familiar with some of the content or part of that content. You can do HTML, CSS, some JavaScript experience, and so forth. And you may be a PHP, you may a little bit about Node.js, but you know the idea is that we will move quickly through all of this, and um, you will need to do some independent study in order to keep up with this. So the full details of the lecture schedule, the assessment schedule, and everything else is available via Moodle. There are, I'll show you a slide with all the details in a few minutes, in case you haven't seen it online. There are two our weekly labs, and you have to attend those. Now, those labs are going to be online currently. We'll have lots of demonstrators available, so you can talk to them. Um, you'll also have um, uh, a summative examination. Okay, um, And the, uh, the, the summative examination, it'll be probably one hour. It's a two-hour break, but the, you'll only need an hour between that. And um, there's a coding assignment in there. There's um, a quiz. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, too. But your assessment, the main point you need to know is that for this module, your assessment is 50% CA and 50% exam performance. So you can actually pass, um, um, you can pass this uh, during, uh, by just doing CA. And uh, you can uh, know, go into the exam knowing that you've passed already. Okay? You're going to have to use Moodle to access the assignments. You submit your, 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 all of your assignments via Moodle, and they're going to be available from Mondays. And uh, I have a schedule for those as well. The labs and the demonstrators that help you when you have difficulties, do use them, do ask them. They don't do the assignment or provide solutions, but they will have tutorials as well for you. Okay? Um, so um, uh, so we, can, we can have a look at that now. Um, let me just show you the, your timetable for CS230. I think I have another little slide here as well. OK, so this is your module calendar. And this document is available for you on Moodle. OK, and I guess what's important here is that you can see that there are, there are a bunch of lectures um, on uh, Tuesdays, and there's one on Friday. And those Friday lectures will be pre-recorded and uploaded. And I'll show you what they look like in a little while. You'll see the lectures are shown in pink on this particular display, and the lab times um, available for the module, you, they're available on Thursdays, 
Wednesdays and Tuesdays, okay? And uh, you have to attend one lab per week. They're two hours long, okay? So these are the days when you have labs. You can see that there's no labs this week, for example, because it's uh, an inter-semester break. And there's no labs this week because there's never labs in the first week. Okay. So um, uh, I'd... Uh, also have shown you when your submissions are due for your assignments in blue. So there are seven assignments for CS230, um, one on the 19th, then the next one is the 19th of February. So you can, so everything you need at a glance is here for each of the weeks. And, um, and then I have one slide as well that shows you a full schedule of all the assignments so that you can plan. Um, um, you could plan this a little bit later. Um, you know, as to when you're going to have to do assignments if they have a date that coincides with um, some other assignment that you're doing. So it gives you a little bit of plan for that too. Um, have a read of the assessment notes here. There's lots of information about what all these stars mean and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So the detail is there. And um, so you know exactly how much credit you're going to get for each assignment and um, uh, when it's released and when it's due. So, uh, and, and what labs are supported, okay? Um, Okay, that's the CS280. Sorry, I, I teach that module as well. So you, um, I'll talk about that. Okay, so let's get back to this. Thing. Oh, let's have a look at Moodle, actually. Let's have a quick peek at Moodle. Um, and I'll show you where you find everything you, you need for this particular module in Moodle. So if you log into Moodle, um, you can go to CS230 um, here. Okay, and you'll get the welcome and overview and those documents and all the information you need um, about the module overview, the lecture schedule, the assessment overview, the assignments calendar, everything is available. You can click to this channel here, there's the official tag. So we'll have, your, your, your setup will look like this and it'll be populated as we progress through the, through the module, okay? The assignments and labs and I'll be announcing labs, uh, about labs tomorrow. And um, if you wanna see what it ultimately will look like, and um, you can look at this is the kind of thing that we would have had from last year. So you can see the lecture would be here. This is week, for example, this is week seven. This is a link to the lecture. These are the slides. I always put up the slides in PDF afterwards. Um, and uh, here are links to the individual lessons. So the second lecture of the week are five short 10 minute lessons. And a lot of the time those lessons include demos. Um, and I, I give you all of the code for those demos that I use. So that's full a zip archive of all of the code. Um, any, uh, any examples or links or anything that will be used to, um, to support those lectures, I provide them for you as well. And I have notes too, which I'll show you a little bit later, um, that I use, and you can have all of those notes as well. So any, anything, my personal notes, um, any of that stuff, okay, um, will be there. So this is what it will ultimately turn into a little bit later, okay? Go back to the lectures. Okay, so as I said, I'll, I'll record the, these lectures, make the recordings available via Moodle, um, and sometimes the technology fails, and I'll be able to do that. If, if, if that happens, I will, record, I will record them, and I will replace them, and then, um, so you will get something, it won't, it won't miss them. But I, I'll always make the slides available as well, okay? And as I said already, and showed you in the, the, the Moodle link, the online lectures are organized as a series of five 10-minute lessons. So each lesson will have a small question at the end, or you can, may not, depends on, on how it works. Um, the, the, if I do that, they won't contribute to your mark, they're just checks for your understanding of the material that's presented, so, so don't worry too much about that. Um, so the examination slide, uh, not this one, okay. Um, what's important to realize is that you have um, uh, a bank of sample examination questions for revision purposes. So you have, a, at the end of this exam, you, sorry, at the end of this, you have an exam. It's a, a one-hour Moodle quiz, um, and there's a coding assignment which runs over, over a day, 24-hour period. And I tend to provide all the sample examination questions in advance. Um, so you'll have a random questions drawn from this bank of questions that are published. Okay, so you can, you can um, quite happily study all those in advance and, and you'll see coming up. There are no surprises here in this module um, how it works. What's important, I guess, is that the same bank of questions will be used for the summer and the autumn. Um, I don't provide any answers, but I will provide feedbacks and solutions if you want to ask me to look at your, your answers um, that you've prepared. So if you get them to me, I'll, I'll evaluate them for you. Also, it's not possible to repeat the continual assessment over the summer, okay? You, you, the work that you do in the semester carries forward to the autumn. 
Okay, so here are the topics that we're going to look at for the first three weeks okay, of, of, of um, this module. The first part of the, the course is broken in, is, is a topic called Structuring, Presenting and Interacting with Browser-Based Content. So we're going to look at um, structuring content with HTML. Okay. Then we're going to look at presenting content with cascading style sheets, and we're going to look at interacting with content using client-side JavaScript. In each of these, you can see that there is, um, there is a, a regular lecture, and then there's going to be a, 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 another pre-recorded. And we we'll start today by looking at this uh, HTML. What's important to note as well, okay, is that um, this is not a web or a graphics design module. Okay, it's not a user experience module, and the module is just about generating, structuring, and presenting information in a networked environment. Okay, it's, um, you can use modern techniques and there are some legacy techniques, and I'd like you to be able to see, see each of those. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm not going to be teaching explicitly in large amounts of detail about HTML, CSS, or just JavaScript. I mean, I'll introduce it and show you how it works, but I'm not going to be you know, going through the, the, the full detail. In, in truth, you probably only need about 10 or 12 tags for this particular one, but you'll be able to look at some of those and see how, it, how, how, how yourself and, you know, do some study there and it'll be fine. So you shouldn't have any problems with that. Okay, but there are lots of excellent resources and I'll point you to those and I'll give you some demos and example code as well. But the, as I said, the reality is you don't need to know an awful lot of them, but you should start thinking about them as soon as possible. And then you work with HTML, then we work on the CSS, and then we look at JavaScript. Okay. Um, my camera is not um, on currently because it looks a bit fuzzy. Uh, uh, you can see. Oh, I'm back. Okay. So um, this is me. Okay. So I'm, I'm here. Um, there was a problem with the camera initially, so we're, we're in now. Okay, so actually, now is a good time maybe to show you where I am. I'm, I'm, you don't know me, I guess, because I, ha I didn't teach you last year. Um, uh, so uh, I, as I said, you know, I'm in computer science, and I, I go into computer science to give these lectures and streams. So um, I'm in my office, so I'm using my live streaming setup from my office. Here is, uh, well, that's the board. Um, uh, camera on the board, okay, camera on me. Mike, this is my live streaming computer. It's a streaming Mac. Um, I got a stream deck for controlling punching rounds. This is the actual machine I use for coding and demoing stuff. Um, uh, keep an eye on Twitter and that stuff here. Um, uh, green, uh, nice, some nice um, Elgato lights. They're cold lights, you know, and that should work to help with the green screen. Um, this is the green screen. Okay. Um, the, the, this is me, okay, so I'm here, um, and this is the rest of the room. If you were to come and see me, you'd see, and uh, so um, this is about it, okay? So anyway, so now you know, and um, this, this is where it's all coming from, um, and um, I come in every week and, and do this from here, okay? Yeah, World of Warcraft in the corner. <laughs> I spent too many years playing games, but anyway, that's another day's work. Okay, so, so um, anyway, so this is where we're, 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 we're coming from, and, um, and hopefully it should work together to give you some kind of, um, some kind of uh, experience that you can actually interact. Um, so uh, we, can look at, we can look at this, okay? I don't stream games. I play a lot of games, but no, I don't stream games with this setup. This is purely work streaming, okay? Um, so it, it should be fine here. Okay, so, um, okay, so really in this particular learning, this example, we have this learning objective. So you should learn what a HTML document is, how documents are structured and represented within a browser. Um, and um, you'll be introduced to the document object model a little bit later and understand how to view and manipulate it this week. And you should become come familiar with the HTML tags and how to use the structured data. You will also become familiar with the resources and tools that assist in HTML development. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to do is a little sign up here saying, John, test Men Mentimeter now. These are notes for me because I do tend to forget things. So what I'd like you to do, let's see if this works. So the um, I, I, reason I, I, I want to use live streaming um, with YouTube, I can get the ultra low latency. Um, I don't use Teams if at all possible because it's hard to get that level of interactivity in some of these things. Um, but what I want to do is, you know, during the classes, I might give you some little quizzes just to help you. As I mentioned earlier, there will be some quizzes. So let's see if this one works for you, okay? Um,
OK, so here we have um, <laughs> a quiz. It's an interactive quiz. So we just want to see you um, to see how well it works. OK, um, so uh, if this works, then we know it works. And um, so I'll open the quiz now and hopefully you can see this. It's uh, you got to go to um, menti.com and type in this code to get to this. And then if you can choose and it works fine, then um, yeah, I'll open the voting now. So we can have a look and see if we can get some interactive feedback then um, um, on this. So maybe you could see that display. Tell me which kitten you think is the cutest and um, it'll be fine. <laughs> we should work from there. Okay, so yeah, we have that real-time interactivity. So. You know, one of the things I wanted to do was to be able to have this kind of thing happening so I can talk to you, you know, with more serious questions, of course, as we work through the course. Um, and um, it also gives me a little bit of feedback as to, you know, whether something is difficult or not difficult or, or whatever for you. OK, and um, so we'll uh, we'll. Uh, yeah, that looks like it's working fine. OK, and um, thank you for that. And um, it's uh, it, it, it looks nice, okay? I think it should be okay, and we, we, we should be good to, um, to be able to work with that. Okay, we've, we've um, a bit of work to do, I guess, you know, real work, I suppose, so um, we can see that, like, you know, Blue Kitten is clearly the cutest, um, and uh, we'll pause it from there and just uh, and leave it. So I'm going to close them. I'm going to close the, the, the system a little bit now. Um, Okay, and we'll we'll uh, oh, we'll leave it there. But we we'll go back to we we'll go back to um, our actual lecture proper. Okay, let's get a little bit more serious, I guess. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, right. I want to first of all give you some sense of what's happening with the um, whole notion of data and information. Okay, and it's about structuring content that we see online. Okay, and it gives you a sense of if you understand this notion of data and information, you should have a good idea what's happening when we when we talk about the three aspects or three components to um, the three components to web de web development. So, something I'd like you to think about um, is uh, let me move me. I'm blocking the question at the end. Okay, so data are raw, unorganized facts that need to be processed. Okay, data can be something really simple. It can be um, random and useless until it's organized. And when data are processed, organized, structured, or presented in a given context to make it useful, they're referred to as information. So this is the difference between these two. Okay, let's forget about the cats for a bit. <laughs> you know, we, we'll come back to them again at some point. Okay, so. This is because humans like to make sense of absolutely everything that they see, quickly turning data into information, and we engage in sense making. So, for example, what does the, do these data mean to you when you see them? If you see 266660087, they're just look like just numbers. Okay? But for you, are, are they meaningful in any way? Okay, so there's nothing there to tell you it's meaning. You are actually trying to make sense of these as you work through it. So the same thing happens when you put data online. Yeah, of course, I see your thing. So, so two for me, I see two, it's my favorite number. It's, um, it's uh, the only even prime, the st you know, and, and it's really nice. And the square root of two squared is two. It, there's all sorts of fun things you can think about. It. Six, uh, I don't know, might have cups of coffee I drink today. Six, 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 number of the beast, you know, oh, it's seven. Could be a, could be a, a phone number. 3.145 could be pi, maybe not. Okay, but we, we are here working at this um, to make this um, happen. If you can't hear, looks like I'm, it's, it's working okay, then maybe you could just try, just check your, your sound, okay? Um, uh, stream seems to be okay on, on that. Okay, so, but it, it isn't just about numbers, okay? Data can be styled in order to give meaning or may have color. So what does that mean? What does that thing mean here? So it's a red square, okay? So, but, but does it have any meaning? Does it have any meaning for you? What does what does what does um, what does um, red mean? You know, is it um, hot? You know, or does it mean stop? Or does it mean danger? You know, so we often see something in context. So if you have a number that's encoded, if we take any of the numbers that are up here and we encode them in red, what does that mean? If we piece of text that's encoded in red, look at the information here. I, I deliberately have data here and information here both because they're highlighted. So I'm giving you all of this information, okay? And um, here, um, I'm actually attributing information to the word data, which is, you know, okay. So 
really what we're interested in then is is these these data that we saw so these weren't structured in any way you know they're just lists it's just some, some some numbers and we have some styling here but if we look here on this screen and um, we can see that we have some structured data it's actually organized as a table okay um and this table is a table of information that is a set of facts that are arranged in rows and columns. So it's a way of displaying information. So it requires some medium such as writing or print on paper or some kind of visual display to show us what's happening here. So it's both a mode of visual communication and it's also a way to set out or to lay out data. Structure helps us with meaning and interpretation. And that's why we need to understand structure itself and how to structure with HTML. So the point I guess I'm getting to it from now is that if we just had all these data somewhere, these, these pieces are facts of information, we can structure them to give some meaning. Um, and, and, it's a, and, and it's a way of displaying and turning the information. So structuring, so we have content, we can structure content, and then we can display content. And later on, we'll see about how we might interact with content. Okay, so both um, all of these things are, are important. So the, I guess the key, the key point you need to actually think about is that you need to think about content, structuring content, styling content, presenting it in other words, and then interacting with content. And that's what's key. So if you understand, these are the concepts that we're trying to understand and work with. Um, when we move into a web environment or a print environment or a billboard environment or any kind of environment like this, then what's happening is that we want to be able to then um, affect this, you know, and HTML with CSS, HTML is used to structure content, CSS, cascading style sheets is used to style the content and JavaScript allows us to be able to interact with that content. And then we can, we can, um, once we do that, we can do all sorts of web dev. Okay, so that's useful, okay? And it's interesting we can look at this data. So really, um, we're looking at the difference between data and information. And you can look at this um, and, and, and check later on um, keydifferences.com. It's a really good website for this kind of stuff. Okay, now, if you think about the table that's on the right-hand side this time, okay, um, <laughs> um, then you'll see that it has some presentation features um, that are different from the presentation features in the previous table. Okay, so let's look. Essentially, it's the same content. But what's happening here is that we have changed the style. We've changed the presentation features, the properties, the attributes, etc. Okay, so this style is different when it's compared with the table on this screen here, for example. So it's the same table. It's the same kinds of information. And a lot of the time that's really interesting because, you know, if we want to look at something that's displayed on paper or something that's displayed on your mobile device or something that's displayed on a web device or something that's on a TV, then, then we may have the same content that we want to be able to present, but the arrangement and structure will be different. So if you want to use Netflix, for example, on your machine, then the idea is that it, you, you try to preserve this, okay? So, um, um, and a lot of the time, you know, same thing happens with games. So somebody asked earlier, do you play games? Yeah, I play um, Magic the Gathering, Arena. I play um, Legends of Runeterra, card game, cards. I play Skulls, uh, Elder Scrolls, Legends. I play um, Eternal, the card game. I play a lot of card games, okay? So, so what's happening here then is that, that some of those are available on some machines and some are available on the other because you can't get the display. We don't. We, we only recently got Magic the Gathering on Android devices because um, Wizard believed that you know they just couldn't give that user experience that they would have if you were using a computer itself. So, so um, it does matter. You know, a lot of these matter if you want something that runs on a mobile and something here. So we want a way of minimizing the amount of effort we do. So we want to have, maintain our content, preserve our content, and then display it in a different place by switching in the styles. Okay. Anyway, so what's going on here, I guess, is that this is the same table as the previous one, structurally and informationally, but depending on the presentation requirements, whether it's online print device size, the style can be different. The structure remains constant. So we need to start thinking about separating the style or the presentation from structure. And this table is not interactive. Okay. So this is something that we want to be able to, to look at. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, so if we if we were running, why is this table? Here's a question for you, okay? Um, you stop talking about Yu-Gi-Oh for a minute. Um, my Yu-Gi-Oh days are long past. But um, if if you actually think about the question that's at the bottom here, why is this table not interactive? Well, it's not interactive, but why is it not interactive? Maybe you might let me know why, okay? Okay. Yeah, it's a table, but um, okay. So thank you. Um, I, I I don't know your names yet, but but um, it, yeah, it's a read-only table. The data doesn't seem to get changed, but um, it would be important, I guess, if we if we um, the reason I change the reason it's not interactive is because for this particular application, it doesn't seem to allow us. And yeah, I didn't make it interactive, but actually, I don't have a way of making it interactive here. But if I actually if I moved over to represent this in um, a HTML document, then I could set it up in a way that it would still be static. Okay? And I'd have to code the interactivity in some way, okay? Um, and that would be really, really, really useful um, to do. Um, I seem to have lost my, my display there. Okay, I'm back, okay. Um, so let's see if I can, if I can fix this. So let me let me let me see if I can show you this. Okay, let's pause this for a minute and let's have a look at some code. But it's a good point. Okay, and I guess um, uh, I guess the point there that we can see in the in the chat um, and uh, yeah is that it's not interactive. Okay, so um, somebody asked a question there, which is a quite good one at the end. Um, what's an interactive table? Well. Actually, a spreadsheet is an interactive table. So you're organized as a spreadsheet, but you are, are um, you've got rows and columns, and you can change them and interact them. Okay, so you can click, and maybe you can hover, and you can get some 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 extra information. So so those are the kind of things that we want to be able to do. Okay, so so yeah, and this is, I see a nice re response there from Paul Lloyd, who tells me that yeah, no no there's no action reflected based on any user action. And he, in other words, if I click this. Um, if I hover and all of those things. So I don't have that sort of stuff. But we want to be able to make that kind of thing happen um, when we code. Now, we could look at some code on, for some tables, and I'll do this later in the, in the next lecture. Um, but uh, let me see if I got some code, okay? Um, so here, for example, is the actual code that I use to, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, plus one for Paul. Um, I guess what, what's happening here is that, um, so here I have some code, okay? So I'm, I'm really representing how we might represent this in a file that I've generated called demo1.html. There's no real style here, but I have, I have represented this as this, um, this content and I've structured it using the HTML tags for tables. So it's, it's a nice thing to do. So let's have a look at the directory here. I should be able to see these files okay, that I have for you. So I'll give you all this code anyway, so you'll be able to have a look at this a little bit later. But um, so if I take this and I open with Safari, okay, so here I have um, a, uh, a version of the table that we looked at a little bit earlier, okay? Um, and you can see that some of the content is here. Again, all that's happening is that the information is structured. There is no style here at all. I haven't included any information on style, and I haven't made this a track. So as we progress through the lectures, um, uh, Friday's lecture in particular, you'll see how to do this and how to make it interactive. But I guess it's a good time to tell you that all of the code that um, we would use will be, will be here, and you can, you can take and have copies of all of that code that I will use, okay? So that's a good question there um, about using what I, code you use to write. Um, this is Visual Studio Code. So I'm using um, um, and, um, and Tig, that's a really, really good point. You're, you've got it there. Um, and, and the idea is, can we, can we code that up? So that would be good. And um, I don't have the, all the names, but um, Tihu Broom. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's um, what we can, can we use to write. So I use Visual Studio Code. It's available on Linux. It's visible. It's available on Mac OS. It's available on Windows. And um, I use it everywhere. So it's it, it's really nice. Um, this is the presentation mode. It's quite good. I also use Atom 
okay, um, which is a very nice, um, very nice as well. And um, uh, and this is a good idea to show you a little bit about what what I do um, as well for for you guys. Um, so um, this, for example, I I, pro I I provide produce all of my notes for you guys in in um, Markdown. Okay, so Markdown is is a, a markup language, a minimal markup language, um, which I use. And so I write all of my notes for each of the little 10 minute lessons in Markdown. And so every lesson ha usually has an, uh, an accompanying, um, an accompanying um, file. So this would be CS230, lecture two, lesson two, and it's the Markdown document. And so any notes or something that I work through will all be here. Okay, so I give you all of these notes, okay, um, and uh, and all the accompanying code. So I just use um, uh, I just use uh, my this is a preview, uh, enhanced preview for for my markdown. So you can see and read all the notes with Atom, um, and you can code in Atom as well if you want. You can also uh, use Visual Studio Code, of course, for coding as well. Um, but I tend to I tend to um, use uh, code for my presenting and developing and I tend to use my atom for my uh, writing uh, about code it just makes life easy for me because I've got different kinds of settings and remember I have to um, I have to uh, have a presentation mode so this is this is code um, uh, and so yeah so that's a uh, how it works, but I can actually um, switch here, for example, to from Zen mode to Zen mode into Zen mode. So it makes it a little bit easier for me if I want in order to be able to show you code at different sizes and, and all the kinds. Of okay, so um, anyway, that just answers some of those questions. I hope for for you um, and uh, on on the on the tools. Um, some people in chat mentioned um, Eclipse. Um, yeah, I don't use it um, myself. Um, I, I, I just don't like it. Okay, um, that's just me. Sublime is nice. It's always nice. But you can use whatever you want um, yourself. Um, there's a question there about is HTML just for making tables? No, it's for structuring content. The, the point you've got to make is, remember, is that HTML is about structuring content. Okay, so it's really useful. Okay, and yes, those files are like readme's um, for you. The, you get the full notes there as well. Kind of explains how the code works and where it works. We won't be doing React here. We'll be looking at Angular a little bit later. You can always use Emacs. Personally, when I code, um, as somebody said there, I use VI Editor um, um, a lot of the time with the command line interface to Terminal. You'll see me doing that kind of stuff as well. Okay, um, so it's useful. There's no React. <laughs> um, we'll be looking at Angular near the end of the course. Okay. Um, so okay. So let's get back to 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 questions. And thanks for the questions. Um, it's good that I get this and that you can answer them. And I'll try to respond to them. Okay. So um, and we work from there. And James Doyle has a really nice um, a really nice input there about HTML being a skeleton, CSS the skin, and JavaScript the muscles that make stuff move. And that's really really good uh, analogy there, James. Okay. So we'll. Um, we get back to this, okay? Um, play this. I really like the fact that the new keynote. I'm a Mac user, as you probably guess. Um, um, I've been using Mac since the early 1980s. Um, um, Apple computers, anyway. So, uh, so uh, I do like them. But um, this year was the first time that they updated keynote. Um, which is a nice piece of software, and it allows you to be able to run a presentation in a window, which is really super. Okay, um, but it's the first time ever we've had a feature. Okay, so let's have a look at some HTML then. Okay, so HTML is this markup language for web pages. Um, it's a, it's a, a markup language then is a computer language that uses tags to define elements within a document. It's human readable. It means that the markup files contain standard words ordered in some typical programming syntax. Lots of markup languages exist. Um, two of the most popular ones are HTML, SVG for graphics, and XML. Um, some say that XML is not a markup language at all, but it's a meta markup language because it provides a foundation for creating all sorts of other markup languages. Um, next year, you will have me for CS264, which is software design, and we'll be doing a lot of SVG type stuff with C sharp programming. But um, anyway, so it's, you will see this a little bit as well. We also um, 
have JSON um, is very much like XML, in fact, that it uses structured data in a text format and that's commonly used to exchange data over the internet. And I think I have a full week of lectures on JSON, so we see that a little bit later. The markup language is a language which is used to represent structured co data content. Markup languages are not considered programming languages. The difference of programming languages is not always obvious, for example, because like if you look at XSLT, that's a Turing complete language. In other words, it can simulate a Turing machine. It's based on XML, which is a markup language. So you know, it's just something to, to think about. So I'm, I'm, written, I'm just letting you know that there's opinion is often contested. So don't worry too much about the theory for now, okay? But you know, when somebody says markup language is not a programming language, it's something you could be asked in an interview, for example. Always good to have a good answer for something like that. I just want you to consider HTML, and we'll be using HTML5 to be a markup language which represents structured data in a textual format. So we'll see how to do this now, okay? Okay, so here's a very, here, here's the minimal, like it's, this is equivalent to your hello world scenario here, okay? Um, and um, so it's a simple text file that's created with a standard editor, like code, like VS Code, like Sublime, like VI, like Emacs, like whatever you want, okay? And um, it contains textual content structured using HTML tags. The HTML, the, so this is an opening tag, the doc type. It's a declaration that defines the document to be HTML5. And um, the HTML element is a root element for the HTML document. And you'll see it has a corresponding closing element or tag and um, there's a head tag and a closing head tag and a title these are meta information about this particular document it gives you some information about the document and the content not the content itself the actual content of the document is stored within the body tag and that's closed using a, a, a slash body tag and in here we have a heading and a paragraph so we distinguish this heading from this paragraph using these h1 and p tags and that's just really to tell us a little bit about the, the content and the structure okay um, and as somebody has mentioned there that w3 i i always recommend w3schools.com as somebody in and um, james doyle mentioned in chat there it is the bible i mean this is the the go-to place for pretty much everything you need to know about with um with uh with um web dev stuff, okay, and for this course here, it's super, once you, you know, there's very few things that you can answer by searching and looking at W3 schools, okay, um, so, I mean, and you can just go through and work through that, um, <laughs> yeah, um, maybe it's sacred text, not Bible, but yeah, it's the go-to place, okay, <laughs> um, for sure, and and I think, um, I think uh, what's important here is that you could quickly do that, that, that tutorial there and you will come up to speed in a couple of hours on HTML that really really is good um, and I certainly recommend it so it's a simple HTML document I mean generally I would just show you how to look you can you can um, you can copy this let's let's have a look okay so here's content okay I'm copying the content okay so I'm just literally copied it I'm gonna go to code I create a new file I paste it into code Okay, I've saved it there. I'll save this. Lecture.html. Okay, and you'll notice the code is reformatted and structured. It looks nice for me. Okay, I'll, let, I'll go to um, lecture.html. It's here. I'll open it with Safari. Okay, and this is what we, we get. So we have structured some content. You'll notice that uh, the page has a title. So the window has a title, um, page title here. And that came from the actual code. We can look at the, we can view the source as well. Um, oh, I don't have this one here. Uh, yeah, I should really have done this, but we can look at the source. Okay, so the page title is here. It's the meta information about the page. Um, and uh, we can check. Okay, I can reload this page. And you'll see that, that I've changed the title. We can change the content and structure. It's fine, okay? Um, so that's as simple as how it works, okay? That's how you create an uh, HTML document. You can make it a little bit more complex, of course, and we can, we can see that a little bit later. 
I see some questions in chat. I'm going to go back to there before I move on to the slide. Okay. Um, yeah, MDN is really good, and you'll see tag that I do recommend this um, later on in my in my lectures as well. Um, it's pretty good. Um, Mozilla is super, and the JavaScript their JavaScript information is just second to none, really. You know. Um, uh, there are differences within different browsers. Okay. Um, so you can see, if you look at my machine here, I don't know if you can see the bottom part of my machine here. Here's Safari. Here's Safari Technology Preview, Chrome, Firefox. I also have Opera, a few others there as well. Okay. So it's really, it's really useful. Um, it's really useful to do um, uh, to have all of the browsers installed. So I have them on my Mac. On my Windows machine, I have a Surface that I use, and I have all the browsers available for the Surface as well, um, for Windows. And then I have all of the, I have Linux um, installed, where so I have all the browsers for Linux, and I have all the browsers available for my for my iOS devices and an Android device as well. So if you're developing something that has that's complex, then you have to be sure that it works in all places, then there's a lot of work to do to make sure it works. And a lot of that's handled by the CSS. Okay, so it's a really good question. And it's something we think about um, a little bit later in the module. And, um, and it's something you should be thinking about. And it's good to see people thinking about that now as well. It's really useful. Okay, um, so how, how, how it's displayed. We can detect the browser type and, and do that. You know, if you're, if you're Clever, I mean, you can, I, I have it on this one here. I could have the developer tools here um, and um, you could see how you can pretend, but uh, there's some issues with that. I think um, a lot of places don't like you pretending to be something else, but we can see that again anyway, no problem at all. Um, um, in terms of the external learning, if I was you, I would go, so it's a nice question there from Elliot. Um, external reading, I would go to W3 schools and I would just maybe do the, do the tutorial on HTML, and that would really help you um, as a start. Okay. Um, okay. Let's get back to this. Only got about six minutes. Let's see how we get on. But I mean, I can come back to some of this in the. Um, I come back to some of this in the uh, lessons as well. Okay. Okay, so my advice then, and, and it does, I mean, I, um, I think it would be useful. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot Internet Explorer. Um, I use that, of course, on uh, and Edge, which um, uh, they work um, nicely in, um, well, <laughs> Edge works nicely in Windows. I, Internet Explorer doesn't always work. Okay, but uh, my advice then is to go to W3 Schools, work through the tutorial. Really, really excellent resource. It's my go-to site. Um, it also has a triad editor, which is an online editor. You can open it and have the sample code available, and you can, you can work from there. It's very, very nice. Um, um, here's an important point. You need to play to learn. Okay? So you open an example. Make a change to the encoding. Make a change to it. What do you expect to happen when you make that change? Did it happen? And if it didn't, why did it happen? How, does, how did that impact on your understanding? Play is really, really important. If you're not making mistakes, you're probably not learning. Okay? It's really, really, it's really important to you. Don't feel that, you know, you, everything has to be perfect first time, you know? And even if it is perfect, then change it and break it and see, can you fix it? Okay, try to understand. Um, it's, it's important that practice, this practice, and the, you know, you don't have this fear of things going wrong. You know, it always, things always go wrong. You know, computers, you might, everything, you, you, nothing may have changed and you could come in and your environment may have changed. There might be some API that's changed. So, so get used to making errors and fixing it and reading the errors. You will be fine. Um, it would be, um, it would be a good thing to do, please. It would be really, really nice. Okay. I see a discussion in here actually about edge and, and, and some browsers that are not supported. The main point, I guess, of all of this is that you could say to customers, you have to update your browser, you have to change in order to be able to view this website. So if you're selling something, okay, it's an important point, but if you're selling something to a customer and they've gone there, they are captive at that point. So you don't want to tell them to go do something else. You may have lost the sale. So you try your best to be able to, um, to capture and retain those people. And um, it's not a good idea to send them away, but we can talk a little, we'll talk a little bit about a kind of thing later in, in CS280. 
Okay. I also use virtual playgrounds like CodePen.io and virtual uh, uh, JSFiddle.net for working with small snippets of HTML code. It's really, really useful. Okay. Um, um, we will see some module, some some um, HTML and JavaScript. These are considered just stuff thing that could be done in a couple of hours by yourself as part of your independent study. I mean, I've had this discussion with the extern and so forth. You know, we've so we've so much to do in terms of web dev that we can't do all of that all, uh, at length, all of that kind of stuff. But as I said at the beginning, you probably only have about twelve tags that you need to know anyway, so it should be okay. Okay. Um. So would be worthwhile. So I would go to something like jsfiddle.net, okay, as we can see here, and you can type in your HTML example here, and you can execute and run it, and you'll see it works here. So this is an online virtual playground, copen.io Copen works as well. It's really nice and useful, um, and you can do all sorts of fun, fun stuff there as well. It's a playground. Um, as I said already, you can use VS Code, open the files and so forth. You can install your own web server as well. Okay, And we'll see a little bit about that later. And you can server access the content using a web address. So um, it's a useful thing to be able to do that. There are lots of ways to practice. And there's great tools like the JetBrains Toolbox. This is free for education. And you should try that too. Okay, um, uh, uh, so that's good, okay. And uh, I see your point there about um, Java uh, being a first-year language. Yeah, I, I don't program in Java anymore. I, I like it. I don't use it, but I do some C sharp and I do JavaScript server-side JavaScript as well. So it's um yeah, there are lots of alternatives to Java. But what's important about Java is that it's taught you from first year the basics of programming, and that will help you. Okay, that would be really, really, really helpful because you understand the different ways to code and all of the stuff that you learned for Java will be really beneficial for you in this semester. Really beneficial. Okay, so you could practice using the table tag and, and um, here's a very simple table. Okay, again, it's created using the HTML table tag. Tables are rows specified using the, the TR row. Okay, so here's the row. Um, rows of columns and they're specified using the TD tag. So you can see each of these, these tables can also have headers or headings and they can be specified using the TH tag. So you could consider these sub tags, if you like, TH, TR, and TD um, as sub elements. Okay? You only use them when you're using the table tag. So well formed documents adhere to structuring rules and you'll be able to encounter. Um, these complex structures, which have sub elements a little bit later, for example, forms, etc. Um, and the TD elements, they contain the, the, the containers of the data. And they can contain all sorts of images or elements, uh, images, lists, tables, all sorts of things. Okay, so you could copy this. Let's, um, let's just copy that a little. Okay, so if you want to practice, you know, you could copy this from the lecture notes. You could go to, um, you could go to, here I'm in JS Fiddle. You could type it in here and save it and run it. And you can see you get the results here. There's lots of ways to practice. Okay. So it's all about um, practice. Okay. And it's very, very useful okay, in many respects. Um, so that would be um, useful. Okay. That would be very, very useful. Okay, so we're just up at the at the end of the, the time now and um, some of the last section I will I will work through in the additional lesson um, thanks everybody for coming along today um, it's our first one we had lots of people lots of participation lots of noise and chat as well but that's okay and um, um, as long as you get back on track occasionally it should be okay um, and uh, so I hope you you know, I, I hope you enjoy this module. Um, it's good stuff. We learn lots. We move fast. We work hard. We get good results. And, um, you know, you get well prepared for your placements next year. Lots of jobs in web dev. So thank you very much for coming along. As I say, I'll stay in chat for a little bit longer just so that we can, um, we can answer any questions that you might have. But again, you can always contact me afterwards um, in Teams, by mail, whatever. It will be good. Okay. Thank you very much.